couple of announcements before we get get going tonight. Uh, there will be a celebration of life for Betty Smith here at the church on Saturday, May 8th at 2 p.m., followed by a reception at 3 p.m. And in lieu of flowers, the family requests donations be made to uh, either West Houston Bible Church or KHCB Radio. And then this coming Sunday, which will be May 2nd, we will be returning to our traditional pre-COVID, no social distancing. If you notice, uh, well, there are a couple of signs over there, no social distancing, no masks, back to uh, pre-COVID normal. And on the, then the next Sunday will be the Lord's table, and we will have some trays with the little things that we've been using for those who would like to uh, use those, and then otherwise we'll be passing, uh, passing the elements. Also this Saturday, if you live in Spring Branch, you need to vote. Find out where you vote. And there's uh, two people running for school board. Very, very important. Uh, the, there's a woman running for one position, and she's an extreme leftist. And the person running against her, Chris Ernest, is a uh, conservative Christian. And uh, then the other race is unopposed, so there's not a choice there. Um, and that's an incumbent, so uh, that, that they continue in the, in the slot. So that's um, that's all the announcements that I have for today. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Delight yourself also in the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. In God I have put my trust, I, um, I will not be afraid, what can man do to me? Important promises to remember. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and then uh, I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful that we have you to come to, that we know that you are our rock, you are our fortress, you are our shield, you are our protector. The Father, that, that you take us through difficult circumstances that test our faith for the purpose of our spiritual growth, and we are to approach these with joy and uh, patience and endurance, knowing that uh, they will work together for good and that they will work toward our spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. Father, we see so much going on around us, and behind what we see, there is so much that is so much worse that we can't even imagine, seeking to destroy the foundations of this nation, destroy the uh, uh, truth of Christianity that's taught from the pulpits. Uh, Satan is having a heyday in this nation, but yet we know that you have more than 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. You have... Uh, several million in this nation that are true to your word. And so, Father, we pray that you would continue to raise up more and that uh, you will open the eyes of so many to what is really going on. And, Father, we pray that you would continue to sustain us no matter what happens. We know you will. And we pray that you would help us to understand what we're teaching tonight. In Christ's name, amen. All right, open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to do some review at the beginning because I want to tie a few things together, make some comments, uh, pull it together in terms of the order of the context, and then we will get into several new verses. So the title for this lesson, I could not resist this, Learning from a Dumb ass, because we're going to get into the example and illustration of the dumb ass that spoke to Balaam. You know, it's not politically correct to call a mute person or mute animal dumb, but that is a dictionary meaning of the word. And of course, I resent all political correctness because it's just a Marxist conspiracy, so I refuse to be politically correct. I will be biblically correct, but I will not be politically correct. So we are going to look at what 
Balaam learned wasn't much of a lesson and what happened, why he is such an illustration of false teachers. So we're in the second chapter of Second Peter, which has four divisions. God is warning them of false teachers that are coming. They are here. They have been within Christianity, the wolves among the sheep, for almost 2,000 years now. And they have wreaked incredible damage. And it is amazing what is going on today. In fact, I just thought I would thrill your souls a little bit tonight by giving you just a few headlines from what I've seen during the week. And uh, the first is, and I'm not going to mention this woman's name because uh, you probably wouldn't recognize it. I don't recognize it, but I don't want to give her any publicity. But this woman, the headline reads, uh, this woman says, LGBTQ Christians preach in her church. And she calls for a mass exodus from conservative denominations. She first publicly renounced Christianity in an interview with Jonathan Merritt, whom you probably haven't heard. He is the son of a former Southern Baptist Convention president named James Merritt. And she said, said in that interview that she first questioned evangelical Christianity because gay people couldn't have sex with each other, and she's now calling for a mass exodus from conservative biblical denominations. And she writes on her Facebook page a scathing denunciation of conservative biblical beliefs, referring to those who hold to a biblical sexual ethic and treat the scriptures as the inerrant and authoritative word of God, as denominations and churches that, quote, diminish women, unquote, and, quote, harm or exile LGBTQ Christians, unquote, and, quote, peddle shame and guilt and sorrow. What she does not understand is she is the subject of what is discussed in Second Peter uh, chapter 2. But that's only the beginning. The other is a uh, headline related to yet another Hillsong pastor resigns after yet another sex scandal. Now you're probably not familiar with Hillsong either. This is a denominational corporation based in Sydney, Australia that has churches all over the United States and they over the last year or two, maybe longer, have been hit with a number of sex scandals related to their, uh, their pastors. They are a well-known publisher of contemporary Christian music, and they are somewhat uh, sort of ecumenical, and they have, according to this article and others that I have read, um, had uh, this, he writes this well, this, this attracts scandalous leaders who instead of teaching the word of God and leading a flock of Christians entertain the goats and drop like flies amid their scandals, affairs, and carnality. So that's your second headline. I just had, um, had one more. Let me see here. It's probably over here. And this is more of a warning for us. I got it. Actually, the video that is in this was sent to me by one of the men that's in my pastor's group on Friday morning, a man named Kenny Luff, who's visited here a couple of times because he's got family. I think it's a son, maybe a daughter, that live up in Kingwood, and they get in here in January of each year to visit just about. And he goes, he has a, an apologetics group that's called Hepzibah, Oxford. And it, they meet in Oxford, and during the pandemic, it's been all Zoom meetings, and I have spoken to their group uh, a couple of times, and others in our Friday morning group have also spoken to that group. But uh, one of the men that comes to that, their Hepzibah group is a pastor, roughly somewhat close to my age from looking at the video, and for years, he has been going to the same location here in England where he has uh, done something that doesn't, uh, isn't seen much here in the U.S. He uh, has a, 
he, he preaches out on the street corner. He's a street preacher. He's a 35-year veteran conservative pastor, and he was at Uxbridge Station in West London, and he was arrested last week, last Friday morning, as a matter of fact, while we were having our meeting, um, and for making homophobic comments in public. And he, uh, people complained that he used abusive and harmful language toward homosexuals. And I listened to the video, and all he does is talk about what the Bible says, and he doesn't say it in any kind of, of dramatic fashion or negative way or anything. He's just describing a, a series of sins, and he defined marriage as a relationship between a man and a woman. And that was about as far as he went. And yet people took offense at that, and he was arrested and put in jail. So preview of coming attractions, we hope not. So those are just some things that are going on. And, and I know that our Tuesday night class dealing with the moral relativism and the cycles of discipline and self-destruction that Israel went through in Judges on Tuesday night and what we're studying in Second Timothy chapter 2 are not the most thrilling and edifying and uplifting chapters. They are important for us to understand because it's part of of the Word of God. So uh, this chapter is about these false teachers, the certainty of their coming in chapter 2, verse 1, the destructiveness of their deceptions in verse 1b to 3, the certainty of their judgment, and that's given through three illustrations from events in the Old Testament, and then the assurance of their self-destruction because of their arrogance. And last time, I talked about the fact that because of these, the illustrations that are used, the negatives, those who are disobedient that, that are destroyed, are all unbelievers, and as, uh, also because of the contrast between righteous Lot, and that's not talking about him being uh, a, a, an experientially righteous, uh, uh, an example of uh, moral excellence at all, it is the fact that he is a believer, but he had compromised a tremendous amount, and he was fairly comfortable living in Sodom, but there were times, as the text says, that it was difficult for him, and even the um, when certain events took place, it tormented his righteous soul. And then as we go on into the text, we see that the description of these false teachers clearly indicates that they are unbelievers. Now, it's, it's difficult. We're not going to get there tonight by a long shot, but there's a topical shift that occurs when you get down to um, verse 10, where the pronoun they continues, but the reference of the they shifts from the false teachers to those whom they have deceived. And that's important. And this is a really sticky little problem, exegetical problem, uh, in trying to work our way through all of that that, that I have been uh, spending a lot of time on. So uh, trying to just make sure I get that right. So we've gone down, last time we went down to about 11 or 12, but I want to review and highlight a few things uh, and remind you of a few things as we go through them. So I'll start back at verse 9. And verse 9 is really, it's the, the then clause. It's the main point that Peter is making in verses 4 through, um, down to 4 through 11. And he says, if God did not spare the angels and did not spare the ancient world and did not spare Sodom and Gomorrah, and in each case there was also a group that God delivered. And so the, uh, re the result of, in that condition, there's always an if, then. The then comes in verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the, the text says, the godly. But I'm going to translate that, the believer. Because it is talking about believers in the context. It is a contrast between the godly and the ungodly. And the ungodly are also described as a dikas. Dikas means righteous. The A at the beginning 
It's called the alpha privative. This will be on your test when you arrive in heaven, okay? You have to know this. Uh, it means it's the negative. It's like our word UN. And so the adikos are those that are not justified. They are the unjust. And the dikos are those who are justified. So it's a contrast between the believer, the godly. God, will, God knows how to deliver the believer out of testing. And the testing is living in the midst of a pagan culture. And we're tested every single day in ways that we're not always aware of. He knows how to deliver the believer out of testing. And I always want to remind you of, of uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that de when we're uh, delivered out of testing, it is so that we can endure it using the word of God. There is no testing taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful and will not allow you, be, you to be tested above what you are able, but will with the test make a way of escape. Not so you can avoid it, that you can endure it. That's, and so we have to endure what we're going through, living in the midst of this culture that every day should just, just cause our souls great torment as it, did to, as it did to Lot. If it isn't, then you're not as sensitive as carnal, rebellious Lot. And that is a, something to be concerned about. The Lord knows how to deliver the believer out of testing and to reserve the unjustified under punishment for the day of judgment, which is the great white throne judgment for unbelievers only, described in Revelation 20, 11 to 15. And then verse 10 says, and especially, and especially has that idea of something uh, that you're highlighting, something specific, something that is uh, above and beyond what you just said, and especially those who follow their sin nature in the lust of uncleanness. That's how I've translated this. Because the, uh, the text says, especially those who walk according to the flesh, and that's the language of Paul in Romans 8, but that's not the language of Peter here. He uses specific language. He uses that word in the lower right, apiso, and who follow after, that's peruamai, those who are following after, or if you're following after something, you're being led by it. So they're being led by their sin nature in the lust of uncleanness. And so all these baser lusts in, from the sin nature are being included in that, in that word. And I think, and it says, and they despise authority. All sin is a rebellion against God. Whenever we sin, we're saying, I know better than you do. In some way, we are saying, my way is better than your way. Every time we sin, we're just following in the path of Eve who wanted to, to see if what God said was really true, and we are setting ourselves up as the ultimate determiner of truth and morality. So that is inherent. All sin is based on arrogance. It's based on uh, Satan, who wanted to be like God and wanted to overthrow God's authority, which is why we should call it the angelic revolt and not the angelic conflict. And so their sin nature, uh, they're following, they're being led by their sin nature. They despise authority. It's awkward in the way it's translated. If you look at your English, it, it ends the sentence but then it adds, it says, they are presumptuous, self-willed, period. There's no break in the sentence in the Greek, and there's no they are. So the best way to put it together that I could come up with is presumptuous, self-willed, that's describing them. They are not afraid, and literally the Greek says they do not tremble. They do not tremble to ridicule. And the word there is used three times. In 10 and 12, we have this word as a verb. It's blasphemeo. I bet you can figure out what it means from the English. Blasphemeo. It's bla where we get, we just transliterated, blaspheme, but it means to revile, 
to ridicule, to make light of, to disrespect. So if we were coming up with a very contemporary uh, translation, we might say they diss these angelic glories. They disrespect them. They revile them. They uh, ridicule them. And in uh, 2 Peter 2.11 goes on to say, whereas angels who are greater in power and might, that is greater in power and might than these false teachers, do not bring a reviling accusation against them, against these demons, these angelic glories, uh, before the Lord. And the word that is used there for reviling is the noun blasphemous. So it's really interesting. He's, Peter is really going after this. Arrogance produces this kind of self-righteous arrogance that reviles and ridicules, makes fun of, and demeans that which they are ignorant of. That includes demons, that includes Christianity, that includes uh, that includes God. So this is their hubris. It's just the very height of arrogance. And of course, what it is doing is contrasting the, their total lack of authority orientation toward God. They just, they just hate God, and they're contrasting their hatred for God with the humility of believers who have submitted uh, to God. Remember, James says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you. That God makes war. God is hostile to the arrogant. And so this, in contrast, angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling judgment against these, against angelic powers, against these glories. That's the word that's used uh, uh, I guess, I guess it goes back to verse 10, the angelic glories. And so uh, angels don't revile, revile them, and they don't bring a reviling judgment against them. And this is what we see almost the same language, just expressed a little different in Jude. As I pointed out, Jude is very close to Second Peter. And in Jude 8 through 10, we read, likewise also these dreamers, I love that, because that's exactly what atheistic anti-Christians are. They're dreamers. They have created their own world where there is no God and where they are God. And they live in that world. And the more they live consistently in that world, the more they are divorced from reality. And the more they come up with the more, most outrageous ideas. I mean, when would we have ever in our lives thought that the United States Army would be pay, paying for trannies to get a sex change operation? The other day, a friend of mine who was a, a military career Army officer sent me a, a video and somebody had cobbled together, they had spliced together a recruiting video for the Russian army and a recruiting video for the United States Army. And it just made me want to puke. The video for the Russian army is emphasizing strength and manliness and power and the uh, recruiting video for the United States Army is emphasizing diversity and how much we can all get along and we don't have any room for anybody who has any, any prejudices against those who are, who are different and it's, it's just absolutely horrible uh, what is going on. But that's what these dreamers are up to. They're, they're, they've come up with a totally fallacious view of reality. And so Jude says they're dreamers. They defile the flesh. They're involved in the basest kinds of sexual sins. They defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil. Guess what that word is in the Greek? Blasphemeo again. 
speaking evil, having disrespect for, ridiculing, make fun of, all of that is what blasphemy is. A lot of people think that blasphemy is when you when you use the Lord's name in vain. And no, that's not what blasphemy is. Blasphemy is when you are ridiculing, making fun of God. Uh, that is when you reject him. Taking God's name in vain is when you are swearing an oath that you don't intend to keep. You're, or you say, this is what God wants me to do. And God has not told you that's what he wants you to do. It is using God's name affixing God's name to your plans and purposes when God has not so authorized. This is what happens in numerous, last time we ended by uh, giving you a wonderful insight into the uh, new apostolic reformation and what those, those people are all up to. And those people are taking the Lord's name in vain all the time. That's just an example. They constantly have a word of knowledge, word of wisdom. God is speaking to them. That is reviling scripture because what they are saying is scripture is not enough and God is giving us new revelation and that is taking God's name in vain when they give the same authority to their revelations as they do to the word of God that is the height of blasphemy and taking the Lord's name in vain so Jude says likewise all these dreamers defile the flesh reject authority blaspheme, revile, ridicule these dignitaries. It's the same word in the Greek that you have in Second Peter. It's glory, it's doxa. And it's referring to these, these angelic authorities, these angelic powers. And then Jude 9 gives an example of Michael, the archangel. He is always called the archangel. There's only one archangel. There are different categories of angels. You have seraphim, you, which are seraphs, that's just the plural, seraphs, cherubs, you have uh, one archangel. There are numerous seraphs, numerous cherubs, but there's only one archangel, and then you have numerous other angels that fall into the classification of just messenger angels, and there are different categories there. You have those that are courtroom uh, witnesses, and those are the angels mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3 to the angel of the church of Ephesus, to the angel of the church of Pergamum. wonder what the recording angel associated with West Houston Bible Church is recording, uh, because you have that with every church. Is A record is being kept of how we uh, respond to doctrine and to all those different categories that are listed in Revelation uh, 2 and 3. So Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil. devil. Now we're not told about this in the Old Testament, that when uh, Moses went up on Mount Nebo and the Lord took him home, his physical body was just left there on the ground. And then Satan attempted to do something with it, and uh, Michael was protecting it. So he got, they got into a dispute over the body of Moses, and even in that, uh, Michael did not revile or curse or bring a judgment, uh, statement of judgment against Satan. It says he dared not bring against him a reviling accusation. Again, it's the same verbiage we have in Peter, a, a blasphemous judgment, a he didn't announce that. He said, the Lord rebuke you. He's absolute, total authority orientation. Recognizes it's God's responsibility to take care of Satan. He's not going to be like these charismatic preachers, these televangelists who get up there and stomp up and down on Satan and you hurl abuse at him and all this nonsense that goes on all the time. Of course, you never watch that stuff. I had to spend lots of hours doing that when I was working on my PhD, and my emphasis was on uh, modern, American, uh, modern American Christianity, specifically looking at the holiness uh, charismatic movement. So Jude uh, 10 goes on to say, but these, that is these dreamers, so you have these dreamers defile in Jude 8, and then the, that uh, third person plural demonst near demonstrative pronoun in Jude 10 is going back to that 
phrase in Jude 8, but these speak evil. So this is the third time, just like in, in Peter, you have uh, either the verb or the noun of, for blasphemy mentioned. These speak evil of whatever they don't know. And the Greek is agnoeo, which means ignorant. They're ignorant of what they're really doing, no matter what, how intelligent they are or anything else. They're ignorant of wh what they're really doing, getting involved in the angelic revolt in a way that is completely erroneous. And then look at that in ver at the second half, at the comparison with uh, natural brute beasts. And it probably it's the same language that you have in Peter that we'll look at again, but it's talking about irrational uh, animals that cannot speak. They do not have language, which is interesting because one of those is going to come up when we talk about Balaam's dumb ass. Okay, so they are naturally like brute beasts. In these things, they destroy themselves. So rebellion against God and arrogance is self-destructive. That's even true for believers. If you go into carnality and live on the basis of your sin nature, it is self-destructive. It can lead to all kinds of emotional problems and psychosis and neurosis as, as they were identified by, by a psychiatrist. But guess what? The Bible just says they're the result of sin. They're, it's a result of living in the way that you're divorced from authority in your whole life. And so it, it leads to self-destruction in your intellectual capacities. So I'm going to I gave you several points. I've revised the wording in a few of them just to summarize these false teachers. They follow the lusts of their sin nature. The result is that, as Peter says, these lusts war against the soul. So if you're constantly giving in to the lust pattern of your soul, then this destroys your soul. This is going to lead to emotional and mental problems. It's not a mental disease. A disease is something that you can analyze with the microscope and you can figure out that there are specific causes for these diseases. This is something that is a soul problem. And back in the uh, old days, back before we got into Freudian psychology, for centuries, the pastors were called the doctors of the soul, the curators of the soul. Why could they cure the soul? Because they had the word of God that would heal the problem. But it's, it, it didn't come about overnight. It's not going to go away overnight. And we have to spend a lot of time, somebody has to spend a lot of time in the word before they can recover and God will heal their soul. But it takes time. So these are unbelievers. They're destroying themselves. At First Peter in First Peter two eleven says these are fleshly fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Second, their lust is identified as a lust of uncleanness, and uncleanness is it sort of brings up a picture in your mind of a cesspool or a septic tank or a raw sewage overflowing, something like that. And so this is the idea of somebody who's dragging their soul through a septic tank. And we do that as believers if we're in carnality. They despise authority. They despise authority of every kind. They despise the authority of God, which attacks the first divine institution because we're all responsible to God. Uh, they attack authority in the marriage and in the family. That's divine institution number two and divine institution number three. They despise authority in government. That's divine institution uh, number four. And authority in nations. That's divine institution number five. And they despise the authority of the Abrahamic covenant. So I'll bring in divine institution number six, which is Israel. Because God said, those, those who bless Israel, God will bless those who curse Israel, God will curse. And that applies to believers or unbelievers. If you're a Muslim and you are blessing Israel and you are pro-Israel, then God is going to bless you. But if you're, if you're any unbeliever, but if you're a believer that is anti-Semitic, then God is going to bring judgment into your life. 
Fourth, they're antinomians. They reject laws, they reject rules, they reject, reject absolutes. But anybody who rejects one set of absolutes is just going to replace it with their own set of absolutes. Everybody has some kind of scruples. Everybody has certain things that they think are right and wrong. The other night, um, Tuesday night, we were talking about... Um, and we see the same thing here about how God uh, is against these ancient Near Eastern religions because they have merged sex with the worship of God. And so in all of these Baal temples and the Asherah, you have these priests and priestesses who are there. And it's interesting that when you look at the context in the law, that there are specific stipulations about how the priests are supposed to dress. There's not supposed to be any hint of nakedness. Now, why is that? Why does God make a big deal about that? Because in the pagan temples, the priests and priestesses often were without clothes because the center of their worship was to engage in sexual activity with the priests and the priestesses of, of, of the false god. They just didn't go there to sacrifice an animal. They went there to engage in sex. And they called the, for example, the priestess is called a, uh, a, a, a kodeshah. Kadash is the Hebrew word for holy. Okay, and everybody thinks it has something to do with virtue. It has nothing to do with virtue. Kadash is the, is the Hebrew, and when you make it a feminine noun, Kodeshah, it refers to the temple prostitutes in the temples of Baal and Asherah. And th those temple prostitutes were not virtuous, and they were male prostitutes as well as female prostitutes. And just the average streetwalker was a zona. Now, there's this episode that's really bizarre in, uh, I think it's Genesis 28, when Judah, who has had a couple of sons who've grown to adulthood, and one of them marries Tamar, but he dies before he ha they have children. Now, according to the practice of levered marriage, the next son that comes along that is, uh, that's not married uh, is supposed to marry... Tamar, so that she, that she will have children raised up in the name of her husband. And Judah has another son, but he ignores her, and he won't do it. So he's, he's violating the standards. He's being very unjust, biblically unjust. So she's trying to put him in an awkward situation to force him to recognize his responsibilities. Now, I don't think that she went about it the right way. But what she did was she dressed up as a streetwalker. She's called a Zona, not a Kodesha. So he goes to her, but he doesn't have anything to pay with. So he says, okay, she does, he doesn't know who she is because she's disguised herself. And so um, he, he can't pay her. He says, I'll give you a lamb. And he says, I can't, can't pay you, but I will leave as, as a deposit. I'll leave my staff, and, and that's, that's his credentials, uh, his, his seal and his, and his staff. So that's like leaving your driver's license today. So he's got to get his driver's license back. So he sends a pagan Canaanite friend of his to, get, to take the lamb and to get his credentials back. But, but see, this guy's got scruples. He's a Canaanite. So when he's looking for a prostitute, he's looking for a Kodesha, and he can't find her. And, uh, and he comes back and tells Judah he can't find her, and, and then Judah gives him more information because he, he had scruples. He, wasn't gonna, he wouldn't go to a Zona. He would only go to a Kodesha. Whereas Judah was carnal, of course, and, and, but he wasn't all the way gone, and he wouldn't go to a Kodesha, but he would go to a Zona. So the Hebrew kind of brings out these little nuances of the drama that's going on there. And um, it's it just that, that they, even, even somebody who's purely antinomian has their own rules. 
And so when we look at the antinomians on the left today, they have their own rules, and they're going to be in, they're trying to impose them on our whole culture through things like critical race theory and social justice, and of course all these things are all tied in uh, cultural Marxism, and the technical term, they use this, it's really an alternate religion, it's a worldview, and it's critical social justice, that's, that's the name of it. But they have their own values. And if you don't go along with those values, you're a racist. You're, you're a racist, homophobic, misogynist, heterosexual pervert. That's what you are. Wear that with pride. So these false teachers are self-willed. They have maximized all of the arrogant skills, and they're now seeking to make human hybrids through seeking to make, uh, seek, uh, through genetic manipulation. I read an article on this just yesterday, how they're introducing humans' genes into all kinds of different animals to make these hybrid things. So we, we want to make ourselves into, into a creator. In all of this, there are various religious and Christian leaders willing to play along because they are blind. They want the popularity, and they fit the mold of these false teachers, as we'll see with the example from, uh, from Balaam. So in 2 Peter 2.12, Paul then says, but these, now pay attention to the these and the they, and try to keep identify who they are as you read this. The but these in verse 12 is talking about these false teachers. It just goes back to the false teachers that are introduced in chapter 2, verse 1. But these, and, and they're men. Why do we know they're men? We're men because when you look down at verse 14, it says they have eyes filled with adulteresses. What does that mean? It means that every time they're, they meet women and see women, they're trying to figure out if they, can, if, if they would be, be, could be seduced. They're looking for uh, sexual pleasure everywhere they can go. So it, obviously this is talking about men, and at that time that was, th that was dominant. But today we have lots of these false teachers who are women who are just as, as bad as any, any men. Uh, so these, these false teachers like are, are compared to, the text says, natural brute beasts. And it uses the word for natural, it's the word fusikos, and uh, it, it should be understood as uh, by nature. They are alagos. The A there is that God's going to ask you that at the, when you get to heaven. What's that A mean? It's an alpha privative. It means not. So not, no logos, no words, literally. So they have no speech. They're irrational. They, they can't think. So uh, literally what this is saying is that they are, um, they, they are uh, beasts who are irrational Irrational beasts, irrational creatures of instinct or natural uh, irrational creatures, something along those lines that are not born to be caught. The word is ganao. They are, uh, it's not they're made to be caught. They are born to be caught. And this, this is uh, God's plan that there are certain wild animals that are be caught and destroyed. And that's what these, these animals, these uh, false teachers are compared to, those who are destructive, and w w you just want to capture them and, and kill them and destroy them. So the analogy with the word like, they're like brute beasts, is comparing the false teachers who ridicule what they don't understand and will in their destruction be destroyed, literally. Whereas the wild animals are said to have been uh, born for the purpose of capture and destruction. So the, the point is, if you are these, these false teachers are to be destroyed, and God will destroy them. That's another reason why we think they are, they are unbelievers. So these men... Uh, like irrational creatures by nature were born to be caught and destroyed. 
They speak evil. Now guess what that word for speak evil is? Blasphemeo again. They revile. They ridicule the things they do not understand. And that's referring back to, to their uh, making these reviling statements even about the angels. So they, they speak evil, they revile, they ridicule the things they're ignorant of, agnoeo, and they will utterly persist. And that is, uh, that's how it is translated, but it should be translated, they will be destroyed in their own corruption, because the word that is translated utterly persist in the New King James it is thyro, and that means to destroy. So they, and it's a future tense. And notice it's a third person plural. So we're following the these are and they are. It all refers to these false teachers. They will utterly uh, destroy themselves. They, they will be, it's future tense, they will be destroyed in their own corruption. So this is talking about self deception. Okay, that's what we've covered pretty far. And that's what's happening. So when you see these people on TV or whatever, you just have to recognize it. Put it in the Lord's hands. He is going to take care of it. Now, I want to look. We always love these. I don't know how well you can read all of that. But there's a couple of things I want to point out as we go forward. We've already looked at 2.12. But as we go down to verse 17, we have to pay attention to a couple of phrases. One of these are the, 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 uh, that we look at the, are the pronouns and the demonstrative pronouns. You know, grammar lesson. This Bible, this is a near demonstrative. It's what I'm talking about. It's here. If I'm talking about Bryce's Bible back there, I'll say that Bible. That's a far demonstrative. So this, this and these are near. Those and that are far away. So he's talking about these, the context of what he's discussing. So I've highlighted this because in some places it's not clear. For example, at the end of verse 12 where it says, will be destroyed, it's a third person plural in the Greek. So we know that it's, it's, that's how it should be translated. These men and they will be destroyed in their own corruption. But you have these other things that look to us like main verbs will receive, who count, carousing, um, while they feast. See, it's got a they there. The days aren't there because these are all participles. So there's no pronoun associated with them. That's how when I'm teaching Greek, I say the way you tell if it's a, if it's a pronoun is when you're look, looking at the, uh, you know, you're using a computer program and it gives you the parsing. There's no number there. There's no first person singular. There's no second person singular. It'll just say, uh, just give you the tense and the voice and the participle, present active participle, masculine singular nominative. There's no number there. And so all of the, the they's that you see in here, here's one I missed, they are spots, are added by the translator to make sense in English. Having eyes, enticing, none of these are main verbs. They're all participles. And I'm trying to, I'm turning my brain inside out, trying to figure out how all these participles relate to the verbs because they're all adverbial, which means they modify a verb. But we'll get to that eventually. Uh, have a heart trained in covetous practices. They have forsaken, that's a participle, uh, the right way. And they have, actually, there's a verb, main verb here, and it's a third person plural. So that tells you that all these participles are all connecting to these finite verbs that are talking about the false teachers as they are these. So that's how, how uh, we go through this. Now notice this in verse 13. It talks about these false teachers. They receive the wages of unrighteousness. And then we get down to verse 15, and we're giving the illustration of one such false prophet from the Old Testament, who is Balaam, the son of Baor, and he, what? He loved the wages of unrighteousness. Same phraseology in the Greek. So that's what the point, part of the point is, 
He was just that one. That guy. He worked for money. He didn't work for truth. He was a false prophet. It was all about the money and, it was, uh, and what he was going to get out of it. And then we get to the end in 2 Peter 2.17. They're described, the false teachers, are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Uh, the Greek for darkness here is a word that is the same deep darkness where the rebellious angels are, um, are sent. They are enchained in deep, in, in deep dark, darkness in Tartarus. So this is just, doesn't say Tartarus, it's just the blackness of darkness. So that tells you that this is the lake of fire. So these are not viewed as believers at all. And their destiny is the lake of fire. Now we think of fire, we think of something that will illuminate things. But the lake of fire is going to be fire without light. It's going to be deep darkness with fiery pain. So what we have here is the, the these are all connected. They all describe the same group, the same people. So we go to verse 13. Will re- and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. Now the word translated pleasure is the one on the top left here, hedone, where we get hedonist. Okay, someone who just lives for personal pleasure and, and just uh, has no restraints whatsoever. And as I pointed out in, um, in our study in Judges, that the reason that the these fertility religions in the ancient world that all mix sex and religion and money together were so attractive because there weren't any prohibitions. Nobody was saying, thou shalt not. And so they could have do whatever they wanted to. It was pure licentiousness. They, they had no restraints on their sin nature whatsoever. And so uh, they just were all, it was all about their pleasure, self-indulgence. They who count it pleasure to carouse, and that is an interesting word. We have it twice, carouse in the daytime, and it says they are spots and blemishes in contrast to the Savior who is with the Lamb without spot or blemish. These are spot or blemish. That's another way we know that they're un- unbelievers, and they are carousing. So this word for carousing, the noun is trufe. And the verb is entrufao. And the noun trufe refers to effeminacy or self-indulgence. So it could be applied to homosexuality. And then entrufe is reveling or carousing, indulging the baser uh, lusts. So this, they just want to party in the, they want to have orgies around the clock. And in their dis- own deceptions while they feast with you, that is feasting at the party. It's a counterfeit Lord's table where we have fellowship with God and call it communion. They are indulging all of their uh, b- worst and baser in- uh, indulgences. And then 2.15 begins also with the participle. I think it's causal because they abandoned the right way. And it's interesting, that's the word on the left, katalepo, and it means to forsake or to abandon. It's the counterpart to the word that we saw in Judges the other night where they forsake, forsook God. They abandoned God and followed after the Baals and the Asherah. It's the same concept. It's, it's abandoning God uh, here they're abandoning the right way, the right path, the path of wisdom, as uh, Solomon writes in Proverbs, and they went astray. Then we have another participle indicating how they did that. They went astray by following the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. So right away the text tells you that one point of context uh, is, of comparison rather, is the wages of unrighteousness. It's, it's all about the money, honey. That's what they want. 
And that's what they get when you see all of these different kinds of uh, things that are going on in the health and wealth movement, the prosperity gospel, all of these things where they, they take Scripture out of context. Scripture says, you know, cast your bread on the water and it will return to you tenfold. And I remember back in the 80s, uh, some, another pastor told me about a man he was counseling because he had been going to one of these churches and he had given them $100,000, his whole life savings, because he was convinced that God would bring it back to him as a million dollars. And he was just taken to the cleaners by these con artists. And this is, uh, this is exactly what, what happens. Balaam is in this for the money. And so because they abandoned the right way and they went astray. So Balaam is the example. And we have to learn a little bit about Balaam. But one other thing I want to look at is this word for went astray is the word planao. And notice it's in the plural, third person plural. So it's they went away. Still talking about the same people, the, the talking about the false teachers. Uh, they went astray. They wandered off. Planao. Anybody guess what the English word is that we get from this? Planet. Because these were the stars that wandered through the heavens. So we get our English word planet from planao. So, and, and then we get the story. So, so um, I don't want to take us there because we don't have enough time to go back to uh, uh, numbers, but back in Numbers 22 to 25, if you want to read about it later, uh, you get the story of, of Balaam. And what happened was the Israelites are coming around. They've, uh, they've come around uh, the, uh, by the Gulf of Aqaba, and they've entered into what is today Jordan. And they're coming up the east side of the Dead Sea, and the Arabah that's south of the Dead Sea going down to uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, and that is the territory of the Moabites. And Balak is the king of the Moabites, and he's already, he, first of all, he knows all about what happened in Egypt because everybody knew what had happened in Egypt and how God had destroyed the Egyptian gods and Pharaoh and the army and everything else. And so... Uh, now they're coming up, and he wants to Kurt wants to somehow destroy them. And so, because all of these uh, people were into paganism, all they can turn to is black magic. You know, juju black magic. So we're going to call in somebody who's a heavy hitter, and Balaam had the reputation for that. He was uh, sort of a soothsayer, prophet, diviner. And he lives somewhere. We don't know exactly where he lives. Uh, the text tells us uh, where the location is, but nobody knows where that was. It's somewhere on the river. And when you read the river in the Pentateuch, that's talking about the Euphrates. So somewhere over in the area around uh, of Babylon. And he is a pagan uh, soothsayer. But what we learn in this rather bizarre episode is God controls people's mouth at times. That's the whole point with the dumb ass, is that God is teaching Balaam that God's the one who controls the mouth. And so anyway, Balak hires him to come and to curse the Israelites. And so he sends a delegation to Balaam and to get Balaam to come. And um, he ta they, they take the money with him and everything else. But, ba but when Balaam sleeps that night, God speaks to him and says, you're not going. You're not going to go. You're not going to curse my people. You're not going. So Balaam uh, probably not had that happen before. And so he got up the next morning, told them, I can't come. God won't let me. And so they went back and they told Balak. And Balak said, take more money. And he sent a more prestigious group of dignitaries to go and negotiate with Balaam. And man, he's really looking at all that money and doesn't want to give it up. And so when God appeared to him in a dream that night and told him not to go, he's saying he starts negotiating with God and God sort of relents. But see, God is going to teach him a lesson. 
And so God tells him, quote, in Numbers 22, 20, if the men come to call you, rise and go with him, but only the word which I speak to you, that shall you speak. So Balaam got up the next morning, got on his donkey and went after them. But we're told that God's anger, God's wrath, his judicial uh, wrath was aroused because he went. So even though God gave him permission, that was God's permissive will, that wasn't really what God thought was best. And so God's going to bring a little discipline, teach Balaam a few things. And so uh, the uh, angel of the Lord who is the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, we've talked about that, takes his stand. All of a sudden they're going along and he's on the trail and the angel of the Lord appears and the donkey can see the angel of the Lord, which means the donkey's a lot smarter than, than Balaam at this point. And he stops. And so Balaam starts uh, 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 beating the donkey and... Uh, the donkey turns aside, goes walking out, goes out into the field to avoid the angel of the Lord who's standing there with a drawn sword. And then he, he gets to a place where there's a narrow path. And if you've ever been in the uh, area over there in the Middle East, there's some canyons and places where it gets pretty narrow. And so God, uh, the angel of the Lord blocks the way. And so the, um, the donkey then... Uh, uh, turns aside, and there's a wall on that side. And then again, when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she uh, there's a wall on one side and pushes against that wall, and it crushes Balaam's foot. And so Balaam hauls off and, and uh, hits the donkey, and he continues to strike the donkey. And then there's another episode. The angel of the Lord appeared a little further along and stood in this narrow place where they couldn't turn one way or the other. And then the donkey just laid down under Balaam. And Balaam really got mad at the donkey, struck the donkey with his staff. And this time the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. In the King James it was ass. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said, Notice he doesn't say, What in the world are you doing talking? That always struck me as odd. Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have abused me. I wish there were a sword in my hand, for I would kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey in whom you've ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this? And then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord. So he is learning from his dumb ass that God is blocking him. So the story goes on through those next three chapters, and God allows him to go. But whenever Balaam opens his mouth to curse Israel, out comes a blessing. And it occurred to me that what's going on here is God is demonstrating that he's ultimately the one in control of these situations. And, and so each time Balaam has to bless Israel. And that really irritated Balak, so he sends him home. But before he leaves, we're told in Numbers chapter 25 that Balaam gave them a little advice. They said, if you want to destroy these Jews, the way you do it is you send all of your kodeshah, all your little women prostitutes out there amongst them, and you're, you'll seduce them, and that will destroy them, and that will destroy the people. And so this, this is what happened. They were uh, called prostitutes from the Baal Peor temple that was there uh, in, in Moab. And that, that was the, the whole thing. So um, what eventually happens is, is that, um, uh, um, I forgot the name of the, prof, uh, the, the, the high priest is, um, I have it written here, but I can't see it. Anyway, the high priest of Israel stops it. He's a, uh, grand, or the son of, uh, grandson of Moses, and he stops it. 
And there's, there's uh, several thousand Israelites get killed in the process and executed because uh, Phineas, because of that. And God is going to make a covenant with Phineas that ultimately it's going to be his line that is going to be the line of priests in the coming uh, millennial temple. And that's, uh, that is exactly what happens. Eli's line, because it's so corrupt, is going to die out. And so Phineas's line is going to be the one that takes his place. But what we do with, uh, ba- ba- uh, with Balaam is that uh, three things are evident that are the point of comparison. First of all, he does it for the money. It's all about the money. Second, he undermines the word of God. He refuses to go along with God. He undermines it to destroy the Israelites. And to do that, the third thing is he appeals to their baser instincts, to their base lusts. And so what we see here is Balaam learns a lesson that doesn't really take hold from his dumb ass, and the false teachers are following the same way. Now, 2 Peter 2.16 says that he was rebuked for his iniquity, a dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. And the word there that is translated mad, madness is this word paraphrenia, which indicates someone who is psychotic and completely divorced from reality. And even the confrontation with the angel of the Lord on the path does not shake him loose. So part of the application of that is you need to give people the gospel. But there are some people that, that even if they hear it from the angel of the Lord, or they hear it from Jesus, or they hear it from the Apostle Paul, they will reject it. So it's not up to your intelligence. It's not up to how slick you can present the gospel. It's not up to your intelligence. It's up to God and the Holy Spirit. And so that gives us, it doesn't absolve us of responsibility to do our best and answer give an answer for the hope that is within us. But it does mean that there are some people that are never going to respond, even if God were to appear to them and give it to them. As uh, the rich man was told by Lazarus that that even if uh, Lazarus were to be raised from the dead to go back to speak to his brothers, he said, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't, be, they won't believe a man who has risen from the dead. So when you're divorced from reality, you can reach a point of no, no return. Now this word that is translated uh, speaking, phlegomai, is used in verse 18, and we'll get there in next time, For when they speak, that is the false teachers, they speak great swelling words of emptiness. That uses the same word for the uh, word of the ass talking to Balaam. So we'll get back. But there's an important comparison there uh, that that Peter is making. I think he's poking a little fun at these false teachers. So we'll get back to that next time and see the danger then to believers who get sucked into their falsehoods. Father, thank you for uh, helping us understand what goes on out there, recognizing that ultimately you are in control, and even a false prophet like Balaam was completely under your control. And as we see the deterioration of what is going on in our world today, we know you're still in control. It's your permissive will, but you're also... Uh, perhaps setting things up for what will eventually be the end time scenario. That eventuality might not be tomorrow and it might not be in the next decade, but eventually it will come. And we know that we are simply to trust you that all thing, that you will work all things together for good to those who love you, to those who are called according to your purpose. And we thank you for that comfort. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.